Hi, this is Shotgun Tom Kelly, and now that I have your attention, you wanted to be close to him in the dugout during his impressive 15-year Major League career because he was always watching, listening, and looking for an edge. Now, Kurt Bavakwa brings that edge to Dirty Kurt's dugout, where you can listen, watch, and be a part of the most honest, informative baseball show available today. Now, here's Kurt! Getting everything ready for you. How is everybody today? Well, I know a lot of people in San Diego are having a good day. Had a good day all weekend. And that's why we're continuing to have a good day today, which is a Monday. There are some teams off in Major League Baseball. We'll go over that later when we talk about uh, the standings. But wanted to say hello to everybody out there. Hello, Terrence. First one on board as usual. Most of the time, you know, um, a lot of this show, with good reason, is going to be devoted to Manny Machado today because – just because. Just because. I will tell you what my opinion of the Josh Donaldson-Tim Anderson deal is. Um uh, We'll talk about the hottest teams in the game. Uh, we'll talk the, about the Padres' upcoming series uh, against not only Brewers, but also uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, thank you to, as usual, to Hacienda Casablanca uh, out in uh, El Cajon, 700 North Johnson for their continued support here on this show. Also to our good buddy, Tom Drake, who just happens to be the president of Lasima Oil, who owns uh, multiple uh, Chevron stations throughout uh, the San Diego area. And the, when we put 5790 Balboa uh, on the corner of Balboa and Genesee on the screen. It, it's not because that's Tom's station. It charges the most. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> it is an address so that you can frequent if you so please um, and uh, support the people that support us. I would certainly appreciate it. So, you know, sometimes you have the pleasure of, and sometimes you don't. You know, there are a lot of players that play on the East Coast, and they have played on the East Coast, where uh, even in the midst of all of the TV contracts and all of the partnerships that Major League Baseball has made, and you can watch game after game after game. Uh, I found myself sitting here last night with no Major League Baseball game on TV. Uh, maybe that's because nobody was playing. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the more games that you see naturally, the more times you get to see the players that play on those particular teams. Manny Machado has been in San Diego for a couple of years now. And we've all gotten an opportunity uh, to see him play at one time or another. Well, we all know about COVID. We all know about how it really messed things up in all of our lives. But this year, this year in particular, I'm going to point out 
because even though most games were televised last year, the Padres had some issues last year that we might not have been aware of early in the season, came to light later on in the season, especially after the All-Star break, on why this ball club didn't seem to be running on all cylinders. And I want you to join in and hit me with your questions or comments. I'd like to see them, uh, whether you agree with me or not, it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, we all have an opinion and uh, sometimes your opinions are very enlightening. So getting back to being able to watch players on a daily basis, which I have had the pleasure of uh, watching uh, Manny Machado play up close. And I say up close because I think me being able to watch a major league baseball game on television is almost better than watching it at the ballpark, unless I'm right on the net in the first row. I don't have anything going on around me, people coming up saying hello and all of that stuff, going to the snack bars, the refreshment stands, where you really miss play if you do, if you go there. And I got to tell you something. You, you don't want to miss anything that's going on with a ball hit down the third baseline or not even down the line in the hole between third and short or an at bat when it comes to Manny Machado nowadays. There have been a couple other guys that have played third base. Manny's DH'd. Uh, which is going to be a good thing uh, for this ball club because they're going to be able to keep him uh, hopefully at 100% the whole year. And uh, the DH is going to help quite a few National League ball clubs in that respect with resting, sort of, resting a regular that's normally going to go out and take the field inning after inning, but let them designate as a hitter that particular day, and they can just hang around the bench. You know what? Some guys don't like it. Tony Gwynn couldn't stand pinch hitting. He just didn't like it. Tony knew how to prepare for four at-bats in any given day, but he didn't know how to prepare to be a pinch hitter. It's very strange. But – that happens. Manny Machado, I think this weekend, my mom always used to tell me the cream will always rise to the top. Probably told me that the first day I came home from Little League and I was crying because I went over four. The cream will always rise to the top. Well, I got to tell you something. Uh, Manny Machado has risen uh, not only to the top, but he's become, in a lot of people's eyes, one of the better players in the game. And not just because of what he did this weekend, but what he continues to do season after season at bat after at bat, and especially the thing that I can't point out uh, and put the most on it is his fielding abilities and his throws to first base, which with the exception of one out of 100 are right there. I mean, literally right there. 
even when he's throwing off balance, if he, if he's taking a ball and he's backhanded it down the third baseline and he's falling towards the opponent's dugout, he still makes that kind of throw to first base. Manny did something over the weekend that. You look at it and you go, wow, that's a hell of a day. It's the first time in Major League history that a player's done what Manny did yesterday in San Francisco. The first time in Major League history. I just wanted to make sure you heard me right the first time I said it. Manny hit three doubles. A triple, one base on balls, in five of plate appearances, and he also scored three runs. They looked that up, the analytic department of Major League Baseball. They can find out that stuff real quick. But the one thing that they couldn't find out is why the Giants continued to pitch to him. Um, I posted something on Twitter when I saw the batting order. I sat down to watch the game. The first at bat that Manny had, my comment was that don't expect Manny to get too much. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even get this out without laughing because it, 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 it's just crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Kip, I'll get to you in a minute with your wisecrack about is this Tommy's hat? in a minute, but I, I want to continue to make this point because I, I posted on Twitter that don't expect Manny to get much to hit today with Profar hitting behind him in the lineup because the Giants are going to make Profar beat him. They're not going to let Manny beat him. And what does he do? is he goes out and he does something that no player in Major League history had done before. And folks, he didn't hit it. Put himself in history hitting the ball the way he did with, with them bouncing in the dirt and pitchers trying to pitch around him. And I have proof of that with my old teammate following up my post on Twitter with one of his own, and I'm talking about Tim Flannery, the longtime coach of the San Francisco Giants. That's probably the way he looked sitting home yesterday, scratching his head and then posting this on Twitter. Maybe by the all-star break, the analytic guys in the air-conditioned office might stop pitching to Manny Machado. I think that was like after his third double. No, it wasn't after his third double. It, it was probably after his second double uh, because he had a triple in between his second and third double, which incidentally, his last hit went off of Brandon Crawford's glove. I'm going to sit here and tell you right now, not too many balls go off a of Brandon Crawford's glove. And for Manny Machado to hit a ball as hard as he did, that Crawford couldn't get his glove on it, and it bounced off the heel and went into short left field. And what does Manny do, the guy that doesn't hustle very often? He legs out another double. on a ball that goes off the shortstop's glove and was hit so hard 
that naturally it was a base hit. So I'll get back to the Padre offense in a minute, but I, I got to address this little uh, smart Alec comment by Kip Gross, who's a former major league player, friend of mine living over in the desert area. No, this is not Tommy's hat. If, well, I, you know what? I guess this could be Tommy's hat because when he played in the big leagues for a day and a half or whenever it was, he actually played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. This happens to be, in case you've never heard Kip or I've never told you, this is started out with and always has been my favorite hat in baseball. I never played naturally for the Los Angeles Dodgers. They came here in 1957, uh, but I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And I'm sorry to read that uh, Joe Pignatano passed away today. And John is telling us there's only nine living Brooklyn Dodgers left. Wow. So there's nine guys left that are still alive that played on a Brooklyn Dodger team before they came to Los Angeles. Nine guys. Well, so that's that, Kip. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. So getting back to the Padre offense, it's starting to heat up. Uh, Will Myers is swinging the bat well. Jake Cronenworth is starting to swing the bat a little bit. And then there's input from other guys that, you know, they might only be hitting 220, uh, but they're getting some big hits at the right time. You know, Hassan Kim um, is doing well. Jerickson Profar uh, gets himself in there. I got to tell you, the guy that I'm a little bit concerned about, and as I watch the games, like I explained to you, that I, I watch them very close. This guy's got a bunch of holes, and I'm talking about Luke Voigt. You know, if a guy's going to swing and miss a strikeout 35, 40% of the time, that's part of the game today. But when you have two, three, possibly four holes in your swing, and I'll try to explain that and tell you what I mean by a hole in your swing. Max Muncy has a hole in his swing, and it's a breaking ball or a fastball, either one up and away in the strike zone. And if you're good enough to put it right outside the strike zone, he will also swing at it also. That's one hole. Luke Voigt has several. That doesn't make for a baseball player making contact most of the time when they go to the plate. And see, I would not play him um, against certain pitchers. And one of the guys I'll talk about, I might as well talk about it now because uh, he's a prime example is Corbin Burns. And it's not because he won the Cy Young Award last year. It's because Corbin Burns can, most of the time, throw the ball where he wants it to go. The kryptonite for a guy like Luke Voigt. Because of the different locations that you can get him out in. And here I go again. They won't pitch the Manny. But I'm saying if Luke Voigt does play tomorrow night against Corbin Burns and he's throwing the ball the way he can 
he'll eat Luke Voigt up. So if I'm Bob Melvin, I'm not going to have Luke Voigt in the, in the lineup the night. A pitcher like Corbin Burns is on the mound. All right. And keeping a player on the roster. You know, we, we've talked about this in the past. Uh, we've talked about injuries. Um, Mike Clevenger, who was lost to this ball club almost the entire uh, season and is a go get him kind of guy, doesn't give less than 100% on any given pitch. He's back on the I.L., precautionary, supposedly. But that worries the hell out of me. I mean, this ball club is relying on a guy like Mike Clevenger, even though their pitching staff is phenomenal right now. And he's back on the I.L. If you ask me, I love the combinations of a Clevenger Martinez and a Snell Gore or mix those guys up. You got starting pitchers that only go five innings nowadays. Anyway, if you have enough quality starting pitching, as it looks like the Padres do, at this stage of the game. Then you can run two of these guys out there on any given game day, and you're going to get nine innings out of them. You don't even need to mess with Rodgers down in the bullpen, who incidentally have, what does he have, 17 saves already? The only Achilles heel in this ball club so far this year, and there's going to be ups and downs, peaks and valleys, has been their relief pitching to a certain degree. Chris Matt's been great. Craig Stammen has been off and on, but he's having a phenomenal, he's had a phenomenal career here in San Diego. And I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut the guy a little slack. Some guys have to step it up. And I think the arms will prove that the Padres scouting department, baseball operations department made the right choices with putting the Suarez's in the world uh, down in the bullpen. Will we see some of the guys that got sent down to, uh, I think most of them got sent to El Paso, the Lamets of the world, and Morgian and guys like that. Um, will we see they, them again here in San Diego, and will they – uh, participate in what looks to be a winning season. We will see. So Clevenger has got a little bit of a tricep strain, and Bob Melvin says they're being very precautionary. I'll say, putting him on a 15-day dis disabled list. You know, this is an injury that you ice – Put a muscle stem on it for a couple of days and you're good. So they're being extra, extra, extra precautionary. So the Padres are on a six-game homestand. Uh, I don't know if teams are going to continue to pitch to Manny Machado. If they do, He's going to continue to rake the way he is because the ball must look this big to him right now, the way he's swinging the bat. 
Kip Gross. I, I talk to Kip every so often. We've never talked about Will Myers. I've been talking to you people for a couple of years about Will Myers. Saying, leave this kid alone. And he's going to be a good one. I might as well get into it a little bit right now and go over what I've said in the past because Kip just brought up that Will's the key to that lineup. I don't know exactly in what way he means that. I would say that there's a couple of guys that are keys uh, to this lineup naturally. The Hosmers, the Machados, and the Tatises of the world, those guys are key members of the lineup. There's other guys that have to also contribute. Will Myers is certainly one of those guys. Will Myers can contribute. And if you remember the last couple of years when everybody was getting on his fanny for whatever, Will Myers played first base. He played third base. He played right field. He played center field. And he played left field. Everybody goes, well, the outfield, the infield. It's not like that. That's not the way it is. First base and third base are entirely different positions. The ball comes off the bat differently from third base or if you move across the diamond to first base. And it's the same way in the outfield. The depth perception that you have on the baseball when you're a center fielder opposed to left field and right field is totally different. This is what they did to Will Myers from the time he got here, almost from the time he got here until now. They moved them all around. Everything that they asked him to do, he did it. And you know what? He did it pretty good. He did it pretty good. And that's not having guys behind him that were swinging the bats really well. You're going to see that if Will gets selective, like he gets selective against the San Francisco Giants for some reason. He likes to hit off the San Francisco Giants. If that selection process could be extended out to the other ball clubs and he doesn't start swinging the ball out of the strike, he swings out of the strike zone against the Los Angeles Dodgers. You know why this happens? Because the Los Angeles Dodgers know that Will is going to swing at balls out of the strike zone, and they throw it there purposely. Because they don't have all their scouts sitting in the air-conditioned offices, like Timmy pointed out, look banging on their computers to find out how to pitch to a guy and not calling down to the dugout and saying, pitch around this guy. Don't pitch to him. Pitch around him. Just the opposite of what we did with Darren Ruff the other night when we pitched to him and Jock Peterson the game that they attempted to come back and, and win. They they pitched to him like, you know, they were Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Or how about Nolan Arominato and Paul Goldschmidt, if that's better for you. What... When Suarez is on the mound, he's got a 98, 99 mile an hour fastball. 
I don't want to see him throwing breaking balls to rough. Not when he can throw fastballs by him. It drives me crazy. These are the things that I go through when I sit all by myself because nobody can stand being around me. And I'm watching these games at night. Let me close with this. Yankees right now are leading the world with 29 wins. There's five teams that have 27 to 29 wins. The Yankees are only one, and they're the only one in Major League Baseball with 29 wins. The Mets are at 28, and the Padres, Astros over in the American League, and the Dodgers are at 27. This is the National League standing right now, in case you're inclined to say, what can the Mets possibly do wrong? Well, look at last year. But they're in a pretty good position right now. They're eight games ahead of the Philadelphia Phillies and also the Atlanta Braves. Uh, surprisingly, eight and a half games on the Miami Marlins, who are playing good baseball. And if you paid any attention at all, the Miami Marlins have a pretty good young club. So Derek Jeter's no longer there. He left for a reason. Can you put that back up, Joe, uh, for a minute, please? He left for a reason, and I don't know if uh, if I've seen a follow-up article on specifically, because Derek's not that kind of guy. He's not the kind of guy to walk out the door, get on the other side of the door, and turn around and badmouth somebody that he just walked away from. That's the reason he's the kind of guy that he is and that every kid in the world should look up to him. Then the Brewers who are in town now are leading the Central Division. And of course, in the West, it's the Los Angeles Dodgers who have uh, the same number of wins as uh, our San Diego Padres and have a half a game lead. Uh, San Francisco Giants fell down a, a step or two on the ladder uh, this weekend where when the Padres went up there and swept them. And they're five games back right now, but I expect them to continue, even though yesterday, boy, you look at that game yesterday and you go, how do these guys even compete at the major league level? I mean, there were times where they looked terrible. But that's when you have to take advantage of teams. When they're down, when things aren't going well for them, you go in there and you pound them and you pound them hard. And that's exactly what the Padres did yesterday. Let me tell you, I'm going to, unless you want to throw up the American League real quick, Joe, uh, I know you have that available for the viewers. Uh, that's the Yankees up on top in the East. They're five games over the Tampa Bay Rays and seven over the Toronto Blue Jays. I expect the Toronto Blue Jays to uh, compete in that division. Uh, you know, that lead is big right now because the, the Yankees have just been playing so well. But I'll tell you what, watch out for the Boston Red Sox. They're hot right now. They've gotten hot in the last five, six, seven games. And they're a team to look at in that division. In the Central, it's Minnesota over the Chicago White Sox, who we'll talk about one of their players in a minute. And over in the West, naturally, it's uh, – I shouldn't say naturally because the uh, the Los Angeles Angels, better known as Carol California Angels, were in first place in this division last week. Uh, but Houston has taken over uh, and a uh, one-and-a-half game lead over the Los Angeles Angels, who I like to call the California Angels. All right, let's get to the last point of the day. And I want to tell you what I think of the Josh Donaldson, Tim Anderson spat. And this is exactly what it is. You see these two guys looking at each other. I don't know if you guys remember or you watched the show months ago where Joe put up a photo of Tony Clark and Rob Manfred looking at one another with disgust. 
I mean, it was just plain out disgust. Well, guess what? Josh Donaldson is looking at Tim Anderson. Neither one of these guys like one another. This is not, my opinion only, this is not a racial deal. Josh Donaldson is an antagonist, and he's a disturber. Tim Anderson is a hot dog, and he'll stir the pot too. If you haven't heard, Josh Donaldson, I think right then, going back to the picture that Joe just put up, Tim Anderson got the third, and Donaldson called him Jackie. In reference to a man who is renowned in the game of baseball now, throughout the world, as one of the greatest human beings, not only just step foot in a baseball uniform, but be on earth, period. Jackie Robinson was a good man. In so much as there's a day every single year where every player on every major league roster wears Jackie Robinson's number. I'm not black. And I don't know how to tell you how I would feel if I was and somebody called me Jackie. But I have to tell you, if somebody called me Babe, it wouldn't bother me. I would take it as a compliment. I think the media has taken this, has taken it, and is continuing to take it up until now and probably will way, way, way too far. They've made it a racial thing. You know, whether or not Josh Donald meant it in a racial way, you know what? There's plenty of worse things that he could have said to Tim Anderson other than to call him Jackie. Because I'm sorry, if I'm Tim Anderson, I take that as a compliment. That's all I got to say about that. Because I know if I went on, there'd be somebody out there that's going to find something to tweet about, write about, do whatever. And they even suspended Josh Donaldson, one game for that. That is bullshit. That's what I got to say about that. And I'm not sticking up for Josh Donaldson. I'm going from one antagonist to another, which there are a bunch of those in the game. We'll follow up on this. So continue to root for your favorite team. I'm going to continue to root for a couple of my favorite people, uh, Tony and Cindy over at Hacienda Casablanca and El Cajon for continued support of our show. Uh, if you're looking for it, it's 700 North Johnson. Tell them that KB and Joe sent you. Uh, of course, our good friend, uh, Tom Bray. Oh, you know what? We don't even have time, do we, Joe? Next show, I'm going to give this card away. And if somebody's really smart, I might throw another one in. Because the last time I was over there, enjoying some great food, that was uh, Cinco de Mayo. Cindy gave me a couple of gift cards. And we'll give away this card also based on something that I said in this show or the previous show. 
So get your memory banks out. Remember that. And remember that we'll be back again with you next week at 315 on Monday. Uh, this is Kurt Bavaco and Dirty Kurt's Dugout. I appreciate everybody that watched. I appreciate your comments. And we will see whether or not this offense continues to do what it's doing, whether its pitching staff continues to do what it's doing. We will see whether the Yankees can continue to win the way they have, whether the Dodgers, you know, they got a good team. They really do. They don't have the pitching staff that they thought they were going to have at the beginning of the year, but they've got a good team. So until next week, this is Kurt Pavacqua saying goodbye for producer Joe. I appreciate everybody watching. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you.